Hi there, it's Ian here, and you're watching Grumpy Opinions, the show where I'm going to tell you all about what I think of films, TV shows, games, and life in general. Let's get on with the show. Outlander is the generation and century spanning epic historical romance TV show about the Claire and Jamie Fraser family, their children, friends, lovers, and some random people that they bump into. Episode 4, Common Ground, takes us back to the magical land of Wilmington, where Jamie does what he does best, and after two episodes of avoiding doing something, he ends up doing it anyway, and he accepts the British land. But it's clear that Jamie's not 100% on the same page as a governor, but you know, he plays it cool. After that, it's time for Pregnant Parsley to pop up. You know, she's all sad about missing her wee psycho mum, but Claire's there for her. You know, she's got some comforting words and stuff. And then, you know, Jamie tells Fungus to, like, cry the streets looking for Scottish expats, and, like, any members of, like, Jamie's old Ardsmuir Massif who might be hanging around, and, like, get them all involved. Then, it's time for Jamie, Claire, and Ian to head back to the green screen. This for a painting. People would say it wasn't real. As artists had imagined it. Well, near enough, you made uh, I mean to Fraser's Ridge, and they marvel at the post-production's amazing work before staking out the borders of their new land. And then they find this awesome pair of cool trees that mark the furthest point out. So Jamie does what all good Scottish teenagers do, like carves like Jamie for Claire forever kind of into it. And then after that, you know, they're chuckling about all this, and like Rolo the dog wolf thing starts growling. And then eventually they they actually turn around and pay attention, and it turns out like a whole load of Native American supermodels have turned up to like do the blue steel look at them. Anyway, Jamie defuses the situation by showing that he means no threat, and that they aren't all impressed, and then they go away. And back at the homestead, they're marking out boundaries for buildings, and it's all good, except, you know, Jamie puts in one of the stakes and squint, and it's so bad that the Cherokee turn up again and show them how to do it properly, and then they storm off again. And naturally, you know, this kind of perturbs our heroes, and later that night, you know, the camp gets completely trashed, but when they get outside, it turns out it wasn't the Cherokee. It was like a bear, and the bears robbed all their food and done like a big nasty scratch on the horse, and despite them like hanging the food up away from the tent where, like you're supposed to if you go camping. Luckily, like Quincy P. Yoko's nearby, and he's got like experience with both bears and with the Cherokee, and he chucks like Jamie some jerky to keep them all fed, and he promises to give the natives some tobacco, like from Jamie, but like to smooth everything over. Although like things are actually okay now because Claire and Ian have had time to catch a bunch of fish and they're discussing like the finer points of net making and knitting and stuff and it's a theme that's continued because Jamie gets home and he starts discussing the fine points of like shooting and loading rifles and stuff with Claire, reminding us that he knows his way around a gun pretty well. And that night they get woken up again but they find Quincy lying injured outside and he's been attacked by the bear so that Claire and we Ian start patching him up and Jamie goes out hunting for it but then something, something's not quite right because it turns out that the bite marks on Quincy aren't from a bear. Because it's not a bear, it's like a loony native dude who's clearly spent too much time watching the 13th warrior. Anyway, Jim fights him up and then like symbolically stabs him dead with a stake, and then the next day he drags him to the Cherokee settlement, and then they tell him that actually, yeah, they knew he wasn't a bear all along, he's just like a nasty rapey guy who got kicked out of the community and then was like shunned and he went absolutely crazy in the wild. So like the next day the Cherokee turn back up at Fraser's Ridge with their chief, and it seems like things are going to be okay, because you know, they sit down to tea and biscuits, and Claire has a chat with like a wise woman who tells her that she had a dream about Claire, and it's something about a moon, and a, and a magic egg, and then there's deaths but they won't be her fault, and it's kind of weird and ominous, and doesn't make a lot of sense, not, not yet anyway. Still, at least everything's calm now, and they can build their offy wee house in peace and quiet. Meanwhile, back in the 1970s, Roger's still kind of despondent over Brie, you know, because he asked her to like, marry him and she said no because, you know, she hadn't even slept with him yet. And then he notices like a mention of Fraser's Ridge in a book that Brie gave him last week. And then after a bit more research, calls her up to let her know that Claire and Jamie actually reunited and they're alive in the Americas, which is more than they knew. And that's all great, but the pair of them are still a bit awkward and neither of them actually says what they clearly want to say. So, you know, it gets left awkward as it is. And then some weeks later, he's like getting the rest of his stuff back from the old manse, and he starts talking to Fiona about Bree, you know, and stumbling over a bit of the Claire stuff. And it turns out that Fee already knows all about Claire and time travel, because like, you know, her gran was one of those like stony dancer, like priest druidy people, and then she overheard some of the conversations between Claire, Bree, and Roger like the year before. And she lays some wisdom on him, but then she like grudgingly shows him a newspaper clipping that she's found that she's a bit worried about. And it only says that Jamie and Claire both die in a fire at Fraser's Ridge, but like the date is smudged, so it could be any time during the whole of the 1770s, and that's like 12 years from the point they're at now. So Roger doesn't know how he can break this debris, but like when he finally does call, it turns out she's not home, because she's actually gone to Scotland like a week or two earlier, meaning she must be planning to go through the stones. 
So what did I think? Well, phew, we're back on track. And by what I mean by that is that this week was actually really interesting, as opposed to last week that was boring as hell. So, I mean, straight off the bat, this has been a great episode because, you know, we had Jamie talking to like, the governor and then Parsley and Fungus like, showed up and they made sure that, you know, we remember they exist and they actually have a, a part to play in these things. And, you know, it's it's good because we actually showed that, you know, Parsley's a person, she's actually worried about her pregnancy and stuff, and that's totally natural, whereas, like, Fergus is actually getting given stuff to do by Jamie, you know, showing that Jamie has trust in him, and he's not just a hanger-on for randomness and because they need a French guy in the cast. And we've also got, like, Jamie and Claire, and they're getting on with the business of making this new home a reality. They're, like, staking out the land, they're finding cool trees, and, like, they're planning, like, some things that they're going to do, like, build sheds and stuff, and, like, how the layout of the house is going to be. And that's all really great, that fun of them making a new home for themselves. I mean, that feels kind of welcoming and lovely. I mean, it's generally the kind of sort of convivial fun that you want to have with a show like this. You know, it engages you more with the characters. I mean, it's a hundred times more engaging than like random conversations over a mule and like Jamie like pontificating about him wanting to be an outlaw or stuff. And like Claire, ch- Claire chasing off into the woods and like getting lost, even though Jamie's like saying, don't go, the, the mule will come back again. And she goes off anyway and she gets lost and lightning nearly hits her. And all of that being no reason for that and it feeling like total filler. Anyway, I also loved that there was all these wee touches this week, like, you know, the governor offering brandy to Jamie, but then, like, him being a bit miffed, because Jamie says, I, and then him pouring him a little less than he did himself, and then Jamie, you know, not finishing it and putting it down. I mean, I, I, there was a really good work there from, like, Sam Hewen in that scene. There's, there was a lot going on in, like, his eyes and his face, stuff going on under the surface. I mean, you know, that was really cool. And then... I also like that there was like wee hints about like that bear revelation, you know, like the fact that the bear bagging didn't work. I mean, because that's the whole point in bear bagging. You hang your stuff like away from the camp so bears don't come and get you. But like, you know, but then they also can't get it because it's hung up. But it got nicked anyway. I mean, and I suppose that could happen, but it was a clever wee hint that there was something not quite right there because like a human would know how to pull that down. But a bear, the idea is it's not supposed to be able to. And then the Cherokee, I mean, I thought that was great. You know, the fact that they actually got all these like, um, like... First Nation Canadian guys in to to play all the Cherokee. I mean, that was a really good idea because it adds like authenticity about that. I mean, they may not be actual Cherokees, but, you know, fair enough that they actually got Native Americans. And I thought the outfits and everything they had on were realistic enough. You know, they didn't look over the top, but they also, you know, they looked lived in. And then, you know, they they, they all looked like serious people. Like, you know, you had to take them seriously because, you know, they were scary enough that, you know, they could be a threat. But they also looked like reasonable enough, intelligent enough that you don't assume that they're just like cartoon villains out to kill everyone. I also love that the fact that we got more of Fiona. I mean, the fact that also she isn't like this this little moon-eyed wee housekeeper lassie that you know we thought maybe she was. It turns out she's actually quite clever and about as sly as her gran, you know. And she's nobody's fool. And here you, know, I thought that was like all we were going to see her of her last week when she was chucking that bottle of champagne. But no, she actually turned up again. I mean, this probably is the last time we will see her because you know as Roger totally moved out. So unless you know he has to go back and speak to her again then I don't see her popping up. But it was really good to actually have her in the show. She was a really nice actress and that seemed to be, you know, doing the part really well. Anyway, good choice. But this is probably where I have to draw the line under things. While this week's episode was really good, a much big improvement on last week and maybe even the week before, there were still a few things that felt a little bit clumsy to me. Maybe it could have been done a wee bit better. I mean, let's start off with the elephant in the room. I mean, or should I say the bear in the room. Now, as soon as somebody trod in poop and said bear, I started wondering. I thought, okay, right, is that going to happen? Are we going to actually have a bear on this? Because, I mean, you know, TV bears are pretty hard to come by. I mean, I remember I read up about some stuff about this back, like on Game of Thrones, where they had that bit where they, they used a bear called Bart the Bear, who's like one of the most famous TV bears, apparently. And they actually had to, like, fly the actors from that away to L.A. because that's where he lives to shoot that one scene. And I just didn't see that happening on, on, you know, Outlander because, I mean, the the show's not quite got the budget that Game of Thrones does. So I thought maybe maybe, they, maybe they'll do that, but I thought, no, probably not. But as much as I love the show, they, they don't tend to do stuff like that. I mean, think back to season one and the boar hunt where, like, clearly there was never a boar in any of the scenes with the actors. They just used a bit of, like, B-roll or kind of, like, stock footage of a boar running around and then the actors sort of, like, react into something running beside their feet or beside their horse. But anyway, I mean, also because like there's been a little bit of cheapness to like this season in terms of the special effects with some of like the the green screening, and I really didn't want them to like do some kind of weird blue screen with a fake bear or something like that. I mean, or or I mean maybe Mio, or if they'd actually saved up and all the money they'd saved had been so they could do a big CGI or an animatronic bear, but it was never going to be up to like the the same sort of level as something like The Revenant, which had like millions to throw at it. But anyway. In the end, you sort of see it behind the tree. And actually, I thought for a second, 
it was going to be a panther because, you know, she'd mentioned panthers earlier. I thought, oh, okay, that may be more interesting. But no, no, it, it was literally, you know, it was literally a man in a bear skin. I mean, thank God it wasn't a man in a bear costume because that would have been terrible. But like, you know, crazy guy wearing a bear skin, you know, it, it at least kind of works, but it felt a little bit cheap. And, and I've not read the books. And, you know, but I did watch the post-show discussion that was on at the end of the episode. And I kind of guessed, even before I'd seen that, that there was probably a real bear in the book. Because I didn't really buy, like, the Cherokee naming Jer Jamie the bear killer for killing a guy who was crazy who wore a bear skin. I mean, that doesn't seem right. You probably call him, like, psycho killer or maybe, like, creepy hobo killer. But the fight itself was decent enough, you know, I mean, it was all right. And there was that nice build-up. And that was a bit of a, a subversion because you'd had all that build-up about him talking about using a rifle and like having to do it, you know, in the middle of a battle. And if you could do that, you know, you needed training and stuff. And and in the end, he didn't use the rifle that much. I mean, he fired it, but you know, and he reloaded it and he fired it, you know, um, but he didn't actually use it like that. In the end, it was a stake. And I actually quite like that idea because he literally kills the bear man with his claim to the land. And that was a nice touch because it was in killing him that actually gets him okay with the, the Cherokee. But still, you know, a real bear would have been better, but you know, that's, that's probably too expensive, so it goes. Similarly, I kind of feel like we're back at the point of convenience plotting. I mean, you know, they, they arrive and the Cherokee don't like them, and then thankfully Quincy just happens to know magic words for Jamie to say to, to, to greet them and they'll be friendly, and, you know, then they just happen to get attacked by the bear man, and, and Jamie just happens to kill the bear guy, and it just happens that the bear, killing the bear guy, you know, is, is a good thing, and then just happen to have the idea to, like, drag the body and drop it at the Cherokee camp, which apparently doesn't have any lookouts, because Jamie manages to, like, drag that huge wooden thing with the bear guy on it right in the middle of the camp before anyone even notices. And that all felt a little bit convenient and coincidental, and it felt a bit lazy. And I don't know who exactly that comes down to. I mean, maybe that's based on a problem with the book, or maybe that's the adaptation. Maybe they've done more like what they've been doing before, where it feels like they're just taking like the bullet points of the story and like adapting it and just kind of clumping them all together, which always just feels a little bit cheesy, and then tying them together with a string of conveniences. But I've griped about that in previous episodes. I mean, as to the, the other side, the sort of 1970s side of the story, um, I, I don't kind of feel like we're getting enough justice to this storyline. Because, I mean, clearly there's a lot of stuff with Roger and Bree going on and they're obviously going to, you know, figure out that they actually do like each other and finally admit it. But I feel like we're not really getting a sense of their characters well enough. I mean, at this point, Roger, you know, he still doesn't make a lot of sense to me as a character. But we're seeing enough of him that he's clearly just a bit of a fusty old professor type, but just but still quite young. I mean, and I can get along with that sort of old, sort of Tolkien-esque, Frank-esque kind of character. I mean, obviously Frank, but without, like, the MI5 and, like, the, the super ninja training that he had. But in terms of Brie, I don't feel like we've actually really gotten an, enough of a sense of who she is, because, I mean, we got that little phone call bit, and it was acted fine, and she's like, oh, cool, you know, thanks, thanks, but, um, oh, oh, but, oh, but oh, sorry, I've got to go off and do a protest, because, you know, because, like, the show has to have her doing something cool and interesting, you know, she can't just be, like, going off to the pub or, like, going down to the shops to get milk and bread, but we've got to show that she, she's really right on, and, you know, and, and proactive and doing cool stuff, but then... It's like, there should have been more fallout after last week. I mean, it would be nice if we'd seen some more of that, of like the drive home or something. I mean, it would have been awkward, but I feel like that would have, like, they must have driven back together and presumably she saw him off to the airport. But anyway, but now she, out of nowhere, suddenly we hear that, oh, she came over to Scotland, but like weeks ago and she never actually told him. I mean, isn't she supposed to be like halfway through a degree? Is she just tossed that away? I mean, is she is she going back in time? Because I mean, if she's coming to Scotland, she's not speaking to him. Then she must be thinking about going back in time. But where did that come from? And I'm sure next week's going to cover that. And maybe the book covered it better. Or maybe it didn't at all. But it feels like there's going to be something coming up. And there was a clip I saw somewhere online. I can't remember where I saw it. It was in either one of the coming up soon, or maybe it was one of the trailers. And there was a scene of her standing beside Frank's grave and sort of talking to it or something. So, I mean, I presume that's next week. And maybe next week will it be all her side of what happened, you know, during, like, we saw everything on his side. But it would be really interesting to do that because I'd really like to actually understand her character beyond her being, you know, tall and ginger and headstrong, and, and, but a little bit thinky and clever. I mean, I really want to actually get a sense of why she would do this, because 
jumping back in time is a really big thing and they haven't really made enough of a point of her missing her mum that it would be that big a deal other than somebody you know the show and tell thing you know somebody says to Roger you know she'll really be missing her mum and then we've got that line from Claire like talking to Parsley about oh you'll really be missing your mum oh I'm really missing my mum you know and we get that people miss their mums but you don't often go back in time like to a completely different world just because you miss them a bit and you go back in time to the completely opposite side of the world when like traveling across like the Atlantic was a really, really bad move. Like you could die really easily doing it. But anyway, I kind of hope that this all gets cleared up. And I'm sure the book readers, you're you're banging your heads off the telly at this point saying, Ian, what the hell are you talking about? This all gets explained in the books. But I haven't read the books and a lot of people watching this won't have read the books. And all we've had of that is, as I said, what the TV show is showing us. So I can't read in stuff that I don't know. And I don't think it's fair to expect people to read in stuff that they haven't put into the show. I mean, as much as it would be great if you could just zoop all the knowledge out of the book into your brain and leave it in the back so it'd unlock as you're watching it without spoiling it. But it doesn't work that way. Anyway, I mean, I still say, say this week was leaps and bounds better than the previous weeks, but I'd be interested to see what, you know, what comes up. I mean, definitely more of this kind of Last of the Mohican kind of Little House on the Prairie stuff. I mean, I, I really, I really get into that. That's really cool. So until next week spins round, I've been Ian, and these have been my grumpy opinions. <laughs>